all glories to Sri Guru and Sri Guranga, all glories to Srila Prabhupada. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Vishnu Vadaya Krishna Vasai Bhavali Shri Bhakti Vedanta Swami Nityanamani Namaste Saraswati Devi Gauravani Pracharane Narvasesha Shunyavari Pasta Chadesha Tadane Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Shivasati Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Reading from Shema Bhavan Canto 10, chapter 57, verse 34. Huh? 34. Iti Vrita Vachasrutva. Naita Vat Iha Karanam. Iti Matva Samanaya. Apraha Kuram Janardana. Thus, Vrinda of the elders of Acha words, Srutva, having heard, Na, not, Etavat, only this, Iha, in the matter at hand, Karanam, cause, Iti, thus, Matva, thinking, Samanaya, having him brought back. Praha said, Akuram, to Akura, Janardana, Lord Krishna. Translation, hearing these words from the elders, Lord Janardana, though aware that the absence of Akura was not the only cause of the evil omens, had him summoned back to Dwarka and spoke to him. For a part, since Lord Krishna is the supreme controller, it was obviously 
by his will that certain troubles appeared in the city of Dwarka. Superficially, these evils may have been caused by Akura's absence, but also by the absence of the auspicious Shamantaka jewel. But we should recall that Dwark is the eternal abode of Lord Krishna. It is a city of divine bliss because the Lord resides there. Still to execute his pastimes as a prince of this world, Lord Krishna did the needful and summoned Akura. Lord Krishna honored Akura, greeted him confidently, and spoke pleasant words with him. Then the Lord, who was fully aware of Akura's heart by virtue of his being the knower of everything, smiled and addressed him. O oh, master of charity, surely the opulent Samantaka jewel was left in your care by Shatadunva and is still with you. Indeed, we have known this all along. Purport, Lord Krishna's treatment of Akura here confirms that he is actually a great devotee of the Lord. Since Satrajit has no sons, his daughter's uh, son should receive his inheritance. They should pay for memorial offerings of water and pinda, clear their grandfather's outstanding debts, and keep the remainder of the inheritance for themselves. Her part, should Sri Rasami quotes the following Smriti injunction regarding the inheritance. Patni du hitaras chayava pitaro brataras tata tat suta gotra bandhu sisya sa brahmacharina. The inheritance first goes to the wife, then, if the wife has passed away, to the daughters, then uh, to the parents, then to the brothers, uh, then to the brothers' sons, then to family members of the same gotra as the deceased, and then to his disciples, including brahmacharis. So Vishnu Chakravarti adds that since Satrajit had no sons, since his wives were killed together with him, and since his daughter, Satyabhama, was not interested in the Shamantaka jewel, which constituted the inheritance, it rightly belonged to her sons. In Krishna's Supreme Personality of God, Srila Prabhupada explains, Lord Krishna indicated by this statement that Satyabhama was already pregnant and that her son would be the real claimant of the jewel and would certainly take the jewel from her her if he tried to conceal it. Nonetheless, the jewel should remain in your care, O trustworthy Akura, because no one else can keep it safely. <clears throat> but please show the jewel just once, since my elder brother does not fully believe what I have told him about it. In this way, O most fortunate one, you will pacify my relatives. Everyone knows you have the jewel, for you are now continually performing sacrifices on altars of gold. Purport, although technically Satyabhama's sons had a right to the jewel, Lord Krishna decided to leave the jewel in the care of Akura, who was using the jewel's wealth to continually perform religious sacrifices. Indeed, Akura's ability to perform such rituals on altars of gold was an indication of the jewel's potency. Thus, shamed by Lord Krishna's conciliatory words, the son of Svapalka, brought out the jewel from where he had concealed it in his clothing and gave it to the Lord. The brilliant gem shone like the sun. Therefore, we can see in this chapter how a valuable jewel caused so much intrigue, violence, and suffering. This is certainly a good lesson for those who desire a trouble-free spiritual life. After the Almighty Lord had shown the Shamantaka jewel to his relatives, thus dispelling the false accusations against him, he returned it to Akura. Her part. For the second time, doubts about the Lord's reputation occasioned by the Shamantaka jewel are dispelled by the jewel itself. Indeed, for the second time, the Lord brought the jewel to Dwarka to establish his integrity there. This amazing series of incidents demonstrates that even when Lord Krishna descends to this world, there's a tendency for his peers to criticize him. The whole material world is infected by the fault finding propensity. And in this chapter, uh, the Supreme Lord demonstrates the nature of this undesirable quality. This narration, rich with descriptions of the prowess of Lord Sri Vishnu, the Supreme Personality of God, it removes sinful reaction and bestows all auspiciousness. Anyone who recites, hears, or remembers it will drive away his own infamy and sins and attain peace. Thus end the purports of the humble servants of his divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedan Swami Prabhupada to the 10th canto. 57th chapter, Srimad Bhagavatam, entitled Satrajit 
murdered and the jewel returned. So here we find the conclusion of this story of, which involves the Shamantaka jewel and how uh, it was taken by the line and then by Jambavan and then by Krishna. Uh, it was turned to Dwarka and then it was stolen uh, by uh, Sasodhanva and given to Akura and then Akura fled uh, to Banaras. Then here he's persuaded to come back and show the jewel to Krishna and Krishna allows him to keep it finally. So as the uh, commentary said, uh, you get a lot of intrigue and problems caused by the Shamantaka jewel because uh, its main quality was it yielded such quantities of gold and uh, because of that uh, people became greedy for it. Uh, uh, so uh, in this way uh, we have a lesson to learn about the possession of material wealth. On the other hand, uh, Krishna felt no desire for that particular uh, jewel, though it had great powers. Uh, uh, when he first heard about the jewel, uh, he was unimpressed by it completely. And the only reason that he got the jewels because people started rumors about him because they were interested in the wealth. Uh, and uh, so in this way, uh, right, Krishna de demonstrated complete detachment from this. So this is one of the qualities of the Supreme Lord. Uh, Bhagavan has uh, got six qualities and one of them is Vairagya which means detachment. So he's not attached to anything in this material world. So here we have gold. How could the Lord be attracted to gold? Uh, the Lord is the source of all spiritual wealth as well as all material wealth. So there's no use for him in uh, becoming attracted to gold. He has everything already. Simply by his very definition, the Lord possesses everything. He has all beauty, all wealth, uh, uh, all powers, uh, etc. So he doesn't need anything. He is completely self-sufficient. Uh, so, of course, in the spiritual world, we find that the Lord is not self-sufficient because he's controlled by bhakti. Bhakti controls the Lord. But that is, again, spiritual. Huh? And it's explained that. What is bhakti? It's the most essential uh, essence of Pladini and Samvit Shaktis of the Lord, which are the Lord's Sarup Shakti. And the Sarup Shakti is responsible for manifestation of the spiritual world, manifestation of the form, qualities, and activities of the Lord, manifesting uh, all the consciousness in the spiritual world and the rasas, and ultimately bliss of the Ladini section. So, the best part of that Shakti is the uh, Radini and Samvit, which are make up Bhakti. Uh, so, naturally, the Lord would be attracted to that. It's his own Shakti. And so, he's attracted to the devotees because they have this Shakti in them. Uh, so, uh, yes, the Lord is Vairagya. He is completely detached from everything. But, He's very attached to his devotees. He's very attached to bhakti. Uh, and we'll have many stories in the Bhagavatam which illustrate this, how he is attracted to devotion, how he's controlled by his devotees, etc. Uh, so, uh, though the Lord has vairagya, that is in terms of material things. He doesn't want anything material. He's attracted to devotees. Devotees are spiritual. They, they, they manifest the sarup shakti of the Lord. Therefore, it's all spiritual, not material. So, therefore, the Lord can be attracted in that way, but he's not attracted to anything in this material world. Uh, what, what is everything in the material world? It is a byproduct of his external energy, not the internal energy, external energy. 
Bahiranga Shakti. Uh, so the internal energy, the Antaranga Shakti means that it is very intimately related with the Lord in the spiritual world. The Baharanga Shakti indicates it's very separate from the Supreme Lord, even though he controls it and possesses it. It's very separate from him and is not much interested in it. Uh, and because of that, he relegates uh, taking care of that uh, Shakti to his Purusha Avatar Amsas, and then Brahma, and Devatas, and sages, etc. So that's not, it's not directly the Lord's interest, this material energy. So it's external to the Lord. And that uh, external energy produces wealth and so many things in this material world. Uh, so though it is the Lord's energy, uh, the Lord is not attracted to it in the sense that he is not bewildered by it does not become overcome uh, by a desire for it. Okay. We can say he's interested in it, yes. Uh, he must uh, guide the material world in such a way that it uh, elevates the jivas. So he does that through various ways. Uh, but he is not really interested in anything byproduct of this material energy. It's uh, completely unlike the Supreme Lord. Okay. It is achit. Uh, the manifestations are temporary. It does not have any bliss in it. Uh -huh. The Lord himself is what? Vijnana. He is conscious, completely conscious, full of knowledge. And he is full of bliss, ananda. And Prakriti is no consciousness, no knowledge, no bliss at all. So, uh, very, very different. Why would he be interested in it? So, no, the Lord is not attracted to this at all. Here we have some gold, which produces more, uh, some uh, jewel that produces more and more gold every day. Uh, so that's all trivial uh, for the Supreme Lord. He owns everything in the material world anyway. Why would he be attracted to gold? Possesses everything. Hmm? We see that the Lord sometimes manifests the Vishwarupa, the universal form. So what does that mean? It means that everything is in the Lord. He possesses everything. It's part of him. So all the gold and jewels and buildings and properties and lands and elements, you know, simply part of the Supreme Lord. And he can do with them as he wishes. Uh, so why should he become greedy for it since he already owns it and controls it? So no, you know, no attraction to this. You hold it all. Uh, other people, however, became attracted to it, like Sata Dunva. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, we have this whole intrigue taking place because of the uh, this attraction for uh, material benefits. Uh, and it illustrates that some people are so attracted to material things, they don't appreciate the Supreme Lord at all. And so that's the case of Satadanva. He had no interest in the Lord at all, and finally the Lord killed him. Now, he saw the Lord, he, uh, he could associate with the Lord in Dwarka, but did not appreciate him at all. Uh, so, very, very unfortunate. Instead, he was attracted to material wealth. Uh, so, uh, we see Akrur, on the other hand, was a great devotee. And even though he was involved in this intrigue, for various reasons, uh, he also was not very really attracted to this uh, gold. So when uh, uh, Krishna requested him to show it, he showed it willingly, and then Krishna said, keep it. Uh, but uh, he was uh, a servant of the Lord, and he followed his order very nicely. Lord told him to return to Panasa, he came back, showed the jewel, he showed the jewel. Uh, so uh, the Lord actually was very kind to him. Uh, in spite of his involvement in this intrigue. Uh, uh, so, therefore, he accepted as a devotee and uh, simply requested to see the jewel. That again shows the Lord was not really interested in the jewel at all. Uh, and then he gives the excuse here, well, Balaram is suspicious of that, you know, uh, who has the jewel, so you should show it. People of uh, Dwarka uh, are, are 
puzzled who has the jewel. So you show it to everybody that you're in possession of it. Uh, uh, so in this way, the, the rumors were uh, uh, annihilated. Uh, uh, people stopped talking. And uh, Krishna demonstrated his quality of not being attached to that jewel at all uh, by the fact that he let Akura keep it. In spite of the fact he says, actually, it should go to the sons of Satyabhama. But anyway, uh, Akura's got it, so let him keep the jewel. So in this way, he was uh, gentle with his devotee and also showed his complete detachment from it, in spite of the fact that it caused so many problems in the kingdom. Uh, so in this way, the uh, situation uh, is resolved uh, concerning this uh, gem. Uh, another comment here is that uh, actually the Lord's abode is purely spiritual. Uh, so therefore, uh, what real calamity can take place there? Uh, what trouble can take place? Not normal uh, weather problems or uh, other problems can take place because it's a spiritual kingdom. So if something appears like that, then we must take that as an arrangement of the Supreme Lord for his own purposes. Uh, so by making this arrangement of having uh, so-called afflictions attack uh, Dwarka, and people started saying, oh, uh, Akura should come back. So therefore, this was an opportunity for Krishna to call Akura back. Uh, and in this way, the whole uh, story was resolved. So, if there appears to be disturbances, actually, they're an appearance only. Uh, and it's not caused by uh, the force of material elements at all. It's the will of the Supreme Lord. Uh, so uh, there's the, later on we have the story of the destruction of uh, Dwarka, where it goes under the water. The waves rise up and they swallow the whole city of Dwarka. That again is an appearance. So our Acharyas say that actually the city of Dwarka is eternal. It is there. And in that city, the uh, Yadus and Krishna are still having pastimes. Uh, so... Uh, there again, we see that there's an appearance of a destruction, but actually the spiritual abode and its inhabitants cannot be disturbed at all by any of this. So uh, when this happens, we take that as some arrangement of the Lord for certain purposes. Uh, so here we find these uh, symptoms, but uh, we should not uh, imply that uh, uh, the city of uh, Dwarka is there for material because it gets afflicted by these various disasters, rather. It's under the control of the Supreme Lord. So it's not uh, a material activity at all. It's something to fulfill the Lord's purposes. I mean, understand that all these uh, pastimes are due to the Lord's sweet will. Because some of the uh, pastime looks like an ordinary modern world. The jewels getting stolen and getting murdered. When the Lord is present. Mm. Well, uh, there are many places like that in the Bhagavatam, in the story of Krishna. Krishna gets born uh, in a prison, and then he gets smuggled out of the prison. And that's not an activity for God, usually. He's born in glory or something like that, and it's Ramchandra or others, or it comes out of the pillar as Narasimhadeva. It's Krishna, particularly. He has a very a different type of birth and activities, etc. Uh, and... Uh, we see that uh, uh, even Brahma gets bewildered that Krishna must be an ordinary living entity, not the Supreme Lord, because he acts like a small child, like a normal small child. So uh, particularly in Vrindavan, Krishna is very bewildering for many people because he acts like a material person. And then later on in Dwarka, we also see that many activities are such that it appears that Krishna is material. There's the one story where uh, the demon takes the head of uh, his father and says, yeah, I've killed your father. And then Krishna begins crying like an ordinary living entity. Uh, but he actually knows the truth. Uh, and he's not uh, attached because of material reasons. Uh, uh, but he begins crying like an ordinary person. Uh, so in, in many ways we find uh, Krishna acts in an ordinary way. Uh, 
in relation to other persons, in relation to the circumstances, etc. But actually, he is supreme lord in all cases, and all of these uh, apparently material type of responses to the world are there for certain purposes of his own. So we should never uh, criticize the Lord and think he's uh, doing things with uh, material, because of material influence. Uh, he's uh, always fixed in his own rasa and spiritual world. So you're explaining this, um, Krishna is not interested with this material world because he is, um, he is a, one good, this is a very good detachment. Okay. What about this uh, in the material world, what is happening? Is he also considered like a pastimes of Mahavishnu, the material pastime Mahavishnu. So, uh, is he attached with this pastimes? Because material also, we see this is eternal, it's always coming and going. If it's not eternal, if it is, uh, although it is eternal, but it's, there is a tempor temporary manifestation. But if he is not at us, then why, why he is creating this, this material world again and again? Well, well we can say that uh, he does certain activities, uh, like of creating the material world, etc. That is also considered to be a pastime of the Supreme Lord. So just as the Lord is attached to his devotees, he's also attached to his pastimes. No, the pastime of creating the material world is slightly different from the pastimes in the spiritual world or in Vrindavan or Dwarka, etc. Because this is uh, directly related to creation of the material world. Still, it is called a pastime of the Supreme Lord uh, in the terms of these amsas or the purushas. Uh, uh, because all the Lord's activities are spiritual, so they can never be material, they cannot have material motive. So, uh, what, does, uh, what pleasure does the Lord get out of this pastime of creating the material world? Ultimately, the pleasure is uh, that he can cultivate devotees in the material world. So he makes all sorts of arrangements for that with the appearance of bhakti and the holy name, uh, manpantara avatars and manpantara uh, manus uh, within the, there, uh, and the appearance of scriptures, etc. So he makes arrangements so that the people can advance and ultimately attain the Supreme Lord. That's when he becomes blissful. So ultimately the goal of the material world is to create bliss for the jiva when he goes to the spiritual world. So in that sense, a leela of the Lord. The ultimate purpose is that to mm. uh, take the uh, conditioned soul from material world to the spiritual world. Yeah. Huh? yeah. And uh, of course, it's a little bit difficult to understand because it's such an uh, 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 indirect, we can say, uh, goal. But then we'll find that even in the shorter pastimes, uh, for instance, the Battle of Kurukshetra, everyone was puzzled, why is this taking place? And uh, even Bhishma says, oh, we cannot understand what the Lord's plan is in all of this, the whole Mahabharata saga and how it, it was going on, everyone was puzzled by it. And, you know, the Pandavas have to suffer for 13 years and whatever. So it causes uh, a problem and no one can understand it. Even the great devotees can't understand it. <laughs> Finally, it concludes and everyone says, oh, that's what the Lord meant. That's what, that's his plan. <laughs> uh, but when it's happening, it's very difficult for people to understand. Uh, what about this, Maharaj? Here, when uh, this uh, Dwarakavasi had a doubt that Krishna might have, you know, hide, hided this um, Samantika jewel, and they started criticizing Krishna. So can you say that uh, this criticism is a spiritual criticism? Well, of course it's not mentioned who, but we would assume that it was not the Yadus, uh, not the devotees. It was other persons who were just like, you know, there, but just like we have Satrajit and uh, or we have uh, Satyadanva who was actually very materialistic who stayed there. And so there were other people also, uh, common people who uh, took up this sort of uh, gossip or whatever. We shouldn't attribute to the great devotees or the others. <clears throat>